Hi there, I'm Kylie Mowbray-Allen from Hello Media. And I'm Jenny Walk from Elephant in the Room Consulting, and you're tuning into Bite Size Business Life Podcast, the show that helps business owners get clarity and insight to grow their dream business. Whether you're launching, ready to scale, or figuring out what's next, we discuss the nitty gritty, the hard bits, the opportunities, and the behind the scenes, and share how we've grown our own companies and helped others do the same. We're glad you're here. It's Jenny Walk from Elephant Room Consulting and Kylie Mobra Allen from Hello Media, and you're tuning into Bite Size Business Life Podcast, the show that helps small business owners get clarity and insight to grow their dream business. How are you, Kylie? How's your Monday been? So great. I love a Monday. How about you, Jenny? You're in another part of the country? Yes, today I am in Canberra. So just finished a workshop here with an organization around leadership, um, leadership attributes and behaviors, and on my way home tonight, back to Brisbane. Beautiful. What time will you get home? Uh, probably nine o'clock. I think the plane leaves here about seven fifteen. So I've got a couple of hours in the club, um, and then heading off to heading home. So I'll land home about nine o'clock. Home at my about nine thirty. So a long day today. Yes, and then where to tomorrow? I have a whole week at home. Whoa! <laughs> That's a celebration then. <laughs> it absolutely is. Like I love being here, and I haven't been. But I realized I haven't been back in Canberra for over probably 12 years since I've been here. So it's actually, even though I was only here for 24 hours, um, having lived here twice in my young adult life, uh, I forget how much and how beautiful Canberra is actually. So I'm uh, looking forward to coming back here for some more workshops in the coming months though. Nice. That's so good. So good. At least you're in the Qantas club. That's a good place to be when you got to hang out at an airport. No, it is. It's very cool. I, um, I've got some uh, classical morella jubes sitting here to eat and a cheeky glass of wine to finish off my day after we do the podcast. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> Good for you. Well, do you know what? You're doing some awesome stuff, travelling, and the topic today is building a strong brand as an entrepreneur, but I think we've got to add into that and doing it your way. And you're doing Definitely. it your way, Jenny. You get to sit in a lovely lounge, <laughs> eat some lollies, drink some wine. It's sounding good. And get paid to do it. That's the beautiful thing, isn't it, about <laughs> being a consultant? I get to, I get to travel and, and work with other clients. I know. It's one of those things, isn't it, when you, when you particularly as a consultant or a coach, or even if you're running you know, a product-based business, being able to choose how you want to show up and how you and when, how you want to run your business is the quintessential freedom that we're looking for as a business owner. I mean, I know when I started running Elephant in the Room Consulting, I didn't dream of having this level of travel and, and this much flexibility, to be honest. I thought I would be kind of stuck a little bit more tightly with clients. But as it's turned out, they allow me to work how I want to work and that just fits in with the clients that I'm attracting, which is exactly what you want. Nice. It's all about who you're attracting to you that you actually want to work with. Exactly. And, and being okay to say no. Like I've had one or two clients over the last couple of years who've approached me to work with them and I really made it difficult for them because I knew that either I would be stuck in a space I didn't want to be, they'd want too much exclusivity of me so I wouldn't be able to grow and build my brand and build my business in other areas. And so having that flexibility and I think importantly confidence to be able to do that is so critical as you grow your business and grow your brand. Oh, the nose. I think I've, I've mentioned to you before that the one day I felt like I had reached my pinnacle of success was the one day that I could fire a client. And I knew yes. that it wasn't the difference between not being able to buy groceries or pay my mortgage if that client left. It was just going to be so good for my mental health. So oh, I know. Oh, being able and to do that is good. <laughs> And in the workshop we're doing today, we're talking about leadership. So we're talking about what are the attributes of leadership? How do we show up as a leader? What does that look like? But also we're talking about what is the shadow that's cast by you being a leader? And I think that goes to as, as, an, as a business owner in terms of the types of clients you attract and how the, the shadow that the client casts on you. And you've got a client who's incredibly demanding and, and you feel like it's taking all your life. That they're, they're casting a really negative shadow, not on just you, but your business. And then that reflects on all your other clients. So I think being mindful of, you know, the shadow that's not only that you're casting on the world, but also what other shadows that are around you and how that's influencing what you do and the behavior you have, I think is really important as a business owner. And it's one of those things when we talk about brand, and we're just talking about how to build your brand. 
But that's part of your brand, isn't it? How you show up and how people perceive you. It really is. And I love that you've talked about it in terms of shadows because I've also recently let a client go um, who actually was a glorious client and there was no issue in terms of her being too demanding or anything like that. The reality was just the lack of paying. And Mm. therefore those payments would come in few and far between. And actually that was too stressful. So, you know, I but that's the shadow, isn't it? That's the impact that's of her not doing that. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. being lenient, you know, finding ways to work with it or make it work better, et cetera, et cetera. At the end of the day, it just was, it was too much and it was too much stress around yeah. that. So. And that can be really hard. Like that's, that takes some conviction, that takes some guts, it takes bravery to make that choice because you, like me, become friends and colleagues and connected to our clients. That's why we do what we do. And when we have to let one go or have to say, look, I'm sorry, now it's not time we can work together, it's really hard and we have to actually process that loss almost as almost, you know, to some extent like a death in the business to say, okay, that's going, how do we process that and how do we move on? Yes, absolutely. And I, I must say I felt pretty bad, but <laughs> what was really interesting that came out of that was – I said to my family the night before I explained what had happened and I said, I actually feel really sad about it. And then the next day a new client came on board with to a whole new package and I was like, wow, so actually clearing a little room, a clearing a little space allows allows the space for new. So Very much felt, so. It felt well-timed. And actually, it's, I know we're talking, it, it, it's probably a nice segue to talk when we're talking about branding. So when I, when I, we first thought about this topic, what came to mind is we're starting a new program, which we're really excited about, and we're calling it Empire Builders. And I, and I love the term Empire Builders because it's not about empire as in like, you know, trying to conquer the world, but how do you build your space? How do you put your stamp on your part of the world and create a, a space that's recognized and connected to you? And to me, that's some of that empire piece, right? It's not about you know, taking over the world rather than just taking over the spaces or the real estate that you want to inhabit and and embody. And that's part of that challenge when we have too many brands and we overextend our brand and we don't have clarity about who we want to show up as, people then don't know how to treat us. And so you start to get all these different ways of being treated and some people are like, oh, it's okay if I don't pay you or it's okay if we do this. And you start to bend the rules because you don't have clarity about what's important to you and how you want to show up for that particular client. And it's one of the challenges, I think, as businesses start to grow and we want to expand our influence and expand the types of products and services that we offer is we have to be really careful about what are we telling the market and our clients when we do that. Oh, oh yes. (laughs) (laughs) Give me an example, Jenny. Well, I think a really good example is you see a lot of entrepreneurs these days when they start a business, you know, and I use a great example as somebody who wants to be, you know, they start as a labor hire company and then they suddenly start selling, you know, widgets and then they go from selling widgets to being a consultant and they go from being a consultant to starting a mechanical engineering company. And so all of a sudden they've got all these different brands all sitting under one banner and nobody really knows who they are. They don't really know how to show up because you're going to turn up differently. How you manage a labor hire company is going to be different to someone who's selling you a widget, whether it's, you know, um, a, you know, a cup or a computer or whatever it is versus to actually as a consultant, they all have different rules of engagement. And I think when businesses don't get clarity around what that looks like and actually say, this is not one brand, these are four separate brands and we need to treat them as four separate brands with four separate contract arrangements and four separate rules of engagement. It it makes it muddy for the client, but it also makes it muddy for you because who do you have to show up in that meeting in that time will pay. Oh, it's so you're so right. I'm having the, the exact issue in my own business right now with our side thing, positive, passionate businesswoman. And it takes up a huge amount of time and resources, et cetera, but it's not necessarily income producing. It's just something that I enjoy and feel very passionate and I have a lot of love for, but it's really more about doing good for women in business. And, but, you know, when something's going to take up a whole lot of resources, you actually need for it to have its own income. (laughs) Yeah, it's got, you do. And, and that's where branding becomes really important. And I know you, you're the queen of brand in terms of helping people bring that brand identity. And I'm so excited that you're going to be joining our Empire Builders in August to help people build that brand and demonstrate what that is in all aspects of the brand. But learning what a brand means, and it's not just about 
you know, I'm elephant in the room consulting. We also have First Nations events and we also have First Nations strategy. Now we chose to rebrand them as separate companies and separate entities so that when people come and engage us, they know exactly who's turning up. They know mm-hmm. this is the business that we you know. First Nations strategy works solely on Indigenous engagement. Indigimesh is solely on, you know, um, printing and manufacturing of, of car decals and banner meshes. And then First Nations events is around running events for First Nations people. Whereas Elephant in the Room Consulting is about strategy and leadership and coaching. And they're very distinct models and they're very distinct brands. And we want to make sure the market understands that. And if we brought that all together, and that's what we started to do, we were doing that all together. And it was just confusing for us. My team didn't know who, to, who was turning up on what day. I didn't know who was turning up on what day. And then the clients get confused and they're like, so who's invoicing me? What are the terms for this? How do I show up? So, so interesting. So you've had to actually then separate them and I've had to then bring mine together. So it's yeah. actually making it clearer that it is part of Hello Media, you know, that it's just this little side joy <laughs> if you want but yeah because it's all run by hello media anyway so i agree it was confusing it's whatever so try and so for me i had to try and not keep them separated and bring them together and i love that you've done that though because it actually then sends a very clear message to say this is also the type of target client and who you're focusing your efforts on as well so when you're focusing on ppw and people know that you can actually share some knowledge and share some of the work that you're doing in hello media and it's a natural connection the clients and the people that you bring into your guest speakers, the conversations that you have, there's an alignment with that. So people understand, they don't feel like that there's this kind of weird selling moment in PPW because it's expected because it's part of the broader brand and part of their broader experience with you. Yes, but I'll tell you, I have one big problem and that is that my clients then all want to be part of that, but they can't if they're men. No, and And that's okay. Oh, but then they have nothing like, you know, then they're like, well, then what, what do I get? What kind of networking can I do? What kind of listing on a website can I get? Da, 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 da. And I'm like, nothing. <laughs> There's nothing for you. And then Which you have to have a terrible. whole conversation about gender equality over the last 200 years. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I can list a million reasons why I want to do just that for the woman. But- <laughs> No, it's really, really, really tricky. <laughs> oh, I love that. And so this is that piece, right? So when we overextend, it's the opposite. Like you're doing a very clear clarity, almost like cons- being very clear about what I'm bringing in together, whereas I want to separate mine so there is very clear clarity. I'm, I'm, I'm having – and it also gives me an opportunity to grow each business independently and that separate brand allows me to target my communication and visibility, all that sort of stuff. But by separating the brands, it means that I can let some go without damaging the overall brand. And that's the challenge you're having now. That dilemma you're having is how do I bring in an, another entity into my brand and still maintain my, my overall kind of concept and what I'm here for and who I'm here to help. And the reality is it's just a massive cost for me at this point. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. You know, yeah. That's, that's the reality. And that's a really, really challenging one. And so in December, for example, when we launched our new membership directory, that is also a ginormous cost. <laughs> so yeah. that's not bringing in what it needs to. So I think it's really interesting how, to, how you look at it. And we all... We all have little fingers and other pies, right? Because that's something Always. entrepreneurs all have in common, I think, is that shiny object syndrome, like what's what how will I grow this next? What's exciting <laughs> me next? You know? And so for me, it was going, well, I, I love this side thing that I have, but now I've got to bring it into the fold more. And for you, you've done the opposite. You've got all these other things, but actually now let's make it really clear that they're completely separate and different. Yeah. Yeah. And I think from our, from my business also as a consultant, it allows me to differentiate the work that we're doing as well by being really clear and niching that. Because I know there's a number of consulting businesses within my market, within my industry, who pretty much say they do everything from recruitment and labour hire to consulting and training. And that might be true and that's great for companies who want that one-stop shop. But I also know that by being very really specific about the work that I do, then I actually have a particular brand around that my credibility and experience are targeted and honed and they know they're getting, um, you know, that 100% when they engage us. They're not getting someone who, you know, is going to be going to try and recruit 100 people down the road at the same time as trying to run a workshop on leadership because like they're different skill sets. So I'm being really mindful that where, where my skill set best placed for that particular brand 
And if I need to hire new skill sets for a new business, I can do that as a separate business when it becomes financially viable. At the moment, we're all running all of them. Like the reality is we're running four different brands and it's still me. It's still under the banner of Ellis in the Room as the kind of holding company or the overall company. But publicly, we have four separate entities and that makes it clear for the market. I can target and it's consistent. Those messages become consistent rather than someone going to Ellis in the Room consulting saying, Who am I, who's showing up today? Is this car details? Is it coaching? Is it consulting? What's happening today? And that's confusing to people. And Jenny, with in terms of that branding, now we all know that a brand is not just a logo. A lot of people say to me, no. oh, yeah, I've totally nailed my brand. I've got my logo. I'm like, well, <laughs> for starters, how many variations of your logo have you got? And he, to think about all the places your logo needs to be, but your logo is literally like 1% of your brand. Yeah. So in terms of your brand and the differentiation of them all, do you go with a theme considering you said they're under the umbrella of elephant in the room consulting? So do they all incorporate the color red, for example? So if we just focus on the two brands, which are the most connected, which is um, elephant in the room consulting and first nation strategy, 100%. So our first nation strategy brand has a, a version of our elephant, but it's just a different pattern on it. So it's the same origami elephant with a different pattern and the, and the, it shows up as First Nation Strategies with that elephant. It's a slightly different position that it has on the elephant room logo, but we're looking to shift and pivot that logo so there's consistency. So if you put the brand side by side, they can see there's a connection. They know that I'm that connecting piece and given my connection and affinity with the elephant, it works well, right? And and they are linked off the website together. But you can Google First Nation Strategy and only get that web page. You don't have to come to Elephant the Room Consulting to get that. And actually on First Nation Strategy webpage, there is no link back. It's just about that particular space. Um, so we do, and we're mindful of that consistency. So I guess that brand architecture is the way that it was described to me once. Is okay. So there's consistency and people go, okay, I can see the relatedness. She hasn't gone from yellow to purple and gone, oh, they're the same brand, although they are complementary colours, but you would, they're not kind of over the, over the top separate. We kind of continue so that messaging becomes consistent. Clever. And then what about the others? So Indigimesh is completely separate because it's a, it's a um, collaborative with myself and, and my business partner. So that has a whole different look and feel. The brand, the logo was identified by somebody else. And that's just got a very simple, clean look. It's really just about we, we want to provide uh, access to um, artwork and uh, Vanamesh and car decals from an Indigenous owned firm. And there's not very many of us around doing that particular market. And as we've said earlier, we're preparing our, our brand and our experience in advance of the 2032 Olympics. We want to have 10 years of runway experience so that when we start going to market for the Olympic bids, we have experience, experience expertise and exposure as a brand. So that's a strategic decision to start that company. So we have capability that we can pitch to Olympic Olympics when they go to market. Now, that may not work. There might be other companies bigger and better than us, but we figure it's a really strong strategy um, as a growth plan. Nice. Sounds great. You've really got clarity around what, what it is and what the, the messaging and the look and the feel is. What I did for Positive Passionate Businesswoman, we went through a complete rebrand about, well, maybe two years ago, and I decided that I would stick with the Hello Media colours. So mm. it looks different in terms of the even the fonts and the logo and all of that, but we're bringing in the same brand colours, which really felt yep. like... It made sense to me. So, and, and I love that, that you do that because if you sit by, side by side, people like you and I, we look at fonts, we look at that kind of style, but a lot of other people don't. What brings them to mind? And you love, and I love your conversations that you have about colour and the importance of colour for catching people and what it means to people. And having that consistent colour means that those values and the, your, you know, the core principles of what the business is set up for are aligned across those two brands. And without people going, oh, you know, again, you could have had that beautiful greens and greys from the Hello Meter and then gone to reds and blues, but it wouldn't have looked consistent. People would have been like, what is this thing? Where, why, is she, why is she part of this group? There's no consistency. And it would have felt like it would have felt wrong. Absolutely. And actually just over the week, I was doing quite a lot of work over the weekend and I needed an extra brand colour. So in came another shade of whatever. So it's funny because six whatever years ago when Hello Media started. I could be seven, I can't remember, but uh, it was it was charcoal and white. That was it. And then I think we're up to about 11 brand colours in there now. So I, I just love how a brand can evolve. 
And, and I love it. So when we talk about brand colours, and you and I have talked a lot about colour palettes and, and what it says to people, but that's really part of that conversation you have about brand identity and positioning. And those colours are so important to position your brand and create that identity, aren't they? Yeah, they totally are. Um, I've got a whole lot of interesting things around psychologically how we view things to do with branding. I think that should be our next topic, Jenny. Talking about brand identity and positioning and particularly what do people feel when they see your brand or what do you want them to feel? And that's the piece I love when you and I have talked about branding is that conversation around, you know, we talk about our businesses and about us. Yes, we own it. Yes, we live and breathe it every day. But ultimately, it's how our clients and customers are responding to our brand and are responding to what we do is what makes us successful. And so understanding your brand identity and its position in the market and how it's showing up actually is really important for being successful in the business. And, you, and I've seen that where you see people with really kind of old school logos or things that don't align. They might have a logo that looks like one thing and their website and it's been created by someone completely different and you start to feel like it's a little bit dodgy and you're wondering if they're actually a legitimate business because there Mm -hmm. is inconsistency across that and it shows up as unprofessional. Whatever unprofessional it means to you, but for me it looks like unprofessional. It looks like they haven't thought about me as a client. Whereas when when we talk about when you've spoken to me, and I remember this conversation way back when you and I first met a long time ago about brand identity and that importance of having consistency in not only the messaging but the identity and the position how it shows up on social media and all the channels and website and print and everything. If there's not consistency, then really what you do is just have a collection of cool images. It's not really a brand, is it? Absolutely. So true. I think it's a, that will be a lovely follow on from, uh, from today's chat is really a deep Definitely. dive into, into branding and how I your brand so. positions you in the market. Yeah, and I think that's, and as an entrepreneur, it's one thing that we don't often, or people often don't think of, they get, you know, I will build it, they will come kind of mentality and that idea. But when you think of all the successful entrepreneurs and we think of all, you know, a lot of people think of Richard Branson, even across his brand, there's consistency in the look and feel of all his brands. And, And when you want to build a brand as an entrepreneur, as an individual, you also have to consider how you want to be seen and show up in the market as well and what the, how that's going to be influenced. So it's not just about the businesses that you create. It's you as the person who's the entrepreneur behind those brands in terms of what you look like and how you're going to show up. Instead of trying to be that one-stop shop, separating to cater to niches, but having that theme or that, you know, the red thread as someone's once shared with me allows you to build and grow without risking the identities of each different product. Yes, absolutely. I love that. Oh, good one, Jenny. It's one of my favourite <laughs> topics. <laughs> well, I'm really excited to, to for you to next week to share that. That, yeah, particularly that psychology behind it. I think that's the piece that we really need to tap into, and I think for for businesses to take some time next week. So between now and then, have a look at your brand, have a think about it, all the different brands, and bring them to the conversation next Monday. And I think that when we talk next Monday around, you know, what that means and what that looks like for your identity and do a little bit of audit between now and then so you can take away from today's conversation next week about where does your brand sit? Fabulous idea. Where does your brand sit right now? And does it look old fashioned? Does it look modern? Does it look, what does it look like? Does it look shabby? Does it look cheap? <laughs> take yeah. a look at it. See what you think. And then next week we can learn about what's what's created and how that might be showing up to you when you share a little bit more about brand identity and positioning. Let's do that. Beautiful. Love it. Look forward to it, Jenny. Awesome. So for everyone listening, we look forward to hearing you listen to you next week. But thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of Bite Five Business Life Podcast. Make sure you subscribe and follow us so you don't miss any episodes, including next week's episode. So great to chat to you, Kylie, as always. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Me too, Jenny. Fly safely tonight. Thanks. Bye. 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 Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.